Um, and, and so as someone who loves um, the Western genre or, you know, works that disrupt the conventional Western um, and, and as someone who is uh, mixed race, Asian American, I, I enjoyed a text that engaged with the genre and um, complicated, maybe potentially simplistic understandings of the frontier or um, Americanness. Uh, like I think Ba's character is really fascinating in that way. So, um, yeah. So that's just my my personal. I I like books that are a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this one class of this one qualifies as like a weird western if you you know a western that has sort of potentially speculative elements I mean I guess if you have a ghost talking to us from beyond the grave you've got some speculative elements right um so I enjoy that but yeah it's always nice to see a a, a frontier narrative that um isn't just buffalo girls <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and you know white male cowboys so like Sam's character is so great in yeah. that way but maybe we can take just a quick minute since we're a cozy group and introduce ourselves I'm not sure everybody knows everybody yeah I'll, I'll just start Denise I'm one of the librarians at San Luis and we've been doing this um virtual book club uh sessions during the semester this is our third one and we've got Anne who is going to be our facilitator today Anne yeah, so I'm Ann Jansen. Um, I'm a part-time lecturer in the English department um, and work remotely for <laughs> institution in North Carolina. You know, I'm kind of all over the place right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I really, I enjoy genre fiction a lot. Um, and so I'm excited to to talk with you all about Zang's book um, during AAPI Heritage Month. So, And we've had Ann a couple times before. She's really a great facilitator, so... Sharon, you're next on my screen. <laughs> so my name is Sharon Haupt. I'm a part-time librarian here at Cuesta, and I teach in the library tech program. And I'll be real upfront and honest, is I have not had a chance to read the book, but I remember I was going back and refreshing my memory because I had heard it on NPR with, was it Steve Inskeep doing an interview with her and how intrigued I was with the book. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to be part of the discussion, even though I haven't read it yet. Yeah, glad you came. We've got Mark on his iPhone. Mark, do you have audio? Okay, Mark uh, is- I maybe do. I'm, I'm also staffing the reference desk, uh, so oh. <laughs> I'm just kind of invisible and- Mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mark's uh, our former library director and now works uh, part time as a reference librarian for Cuesta. Let's pop over to Julie. I'm Julie Smith and I am a uh, retired counselor from Cuesta. And I love to read. And I, I had chosen this book uh, a few months ago when I saw it in um, the Book Reads um, publication I get. And it just sounded really interesting to me. And I was surprised in the way it was written. And it definitely, like you were saying, and it's not a conventional, you know, <laughs> gold rush. And, you know, but but that was cool. The, the nice thing was this was from an Asian immigrant of that era perspective. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, I mean, in a child, in a children's perspective of growing up and trying to make it, you know, in, in a difficult situation. So you know, I thought it was really good, you know, so. Nice. All right. How about Aubrey? And then we'll go to Lori and then we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Aubrey Kwan Roderick. For those of you who have not met, I'm one of the new deans here at uh, Slow Campus um, for Cluster 2. Um, they are English, performing arts, fine arts, languages and communication. I also haven't read the book, but um, <laughs> but I would love to be part of the discussion because it's AAPI month and I'm also a big fan of everything the libraries put on. So <laughs> I'm just so grateful. Thank you. All right, Lori. I am Lori Buckles. I'm the librarian at the North County campus, and I have read the whole book. 
Um, <laughs> even when it got really tough going and brutal. Um, and so I'm just looking forward to our conversation. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And we'll let Anne take it away. And this is being recorded. This way we can uh, post it for anybody that wanted to come today and wasn't able to. Nice. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, well, did you, I, I had a list of questions, but there, you know, I really like to let people guide the conversation. Um, is there any particular direction that anyone wants to take that? Yeah, Sharon. So, you know, most stories that I'm familiar with about the gold rush and everything, talk about people who are immigrating West mm -hmm. and that Westward movement. And this is from the East. And so that's a different point of view right there. Plus, it's children. And I think in the first two sentences, the first sentence, the father dies immediately. Yeah. So how does all of that from that different point of view coming east versus west and children and father being, you know, without parents at all in this new immigrant experience, where it's not instantly, you know, rags to riches. You have to work to get there. So how does that all impact everything in the story and the way it goes? Yeah. Um, well, I'm happy to speak to that um, unless others want to. I don't want to dominate the conversation, um, but I'm also happy to geek out about the book as much as <laughs> Well, I mean, one of the things I, I love that you are thinking about it in that way, because that's one of the things I, I really enjoy about the book. Um, I think a lot about narratives of manifest destiny and this idea of like westward expansion and the great frontier that's usually portrayed as like completely void of people, despite all the indigenous peoples populating the landscape. Right. Um, and so I love that there is like a push against that and sort of an interest in thinking about like, what about what's happening on the Western coast? And what about how that's, you have people in addition to indigenous peoples, you have other immigrants coming to a different shore and, and moving in different directions. Um, I think it's a really interesting refusal of this dominant narrative about how the West was settled and how that looked. Um, I also think <clears throat> Ba's character is so fascinating there because so Ma is an immigrant, but Ba's not, right? Like he talks about the way that the song frames his character is like he's born of this land and the wind and the the water and like he's like a child of North America. Like we don't get parents for him. We get the land itself kind of gives birth to him, right? Um, which is also, I don't know, like I think about his ghostliness and how he becomes the wind and how his um, his children sort of like, uh, especially Lucy, right? Allow his body to be scattered across the landscape. And like, she's like burying little bits of him as she goes, uh, which I think is just so, it's just such an interesting engagement <clears throat> with like, thinking about who belongs or who is like of this land. Um, yeah, I, there's so much that's interesting there. Um, I'm curious what you all think about his, it's like, well, you mentioned the gold rush, Sharon, and I'm thinking about like how Ba is and Sam kind of is a prospector, but it's like, this is like you said, it's not like the typical rags to riches gold rush story. This is something else like I don't know what what are you all thinking about how his prospecting takes shape and Lucy has some um, engagements with gold when she's you know doing her thing later in life being friends with this young woman whose father did strike it rich through the gold rush like I it's a nebulous question but I guess I'm thinking in some ways about um the book's title being a reference to gold and I'm thinking about this relationship between land belonging wealth um I'm just curious what your thoughts are so I'll put a question in there that I had sent along but it does it's not you know doesn't necessarily encompass all of all of that but but what are you thinking about gold I thought, I thought it rung of the false premise of gold sort mm. of the whole the lure 
Yeah, maybe some people make it rich, but actually they probably didn't really make it rich off of gold. They made it rich off of supplying the unlucky gold miners. So mm -hmm. just that, that and, and getting back to the false gold, fool's gold, you know, image. Yeah. So that's, that's what I thought. Yeah, I I kind of um, was thinking, OK, you know, the parentage of Bob, uh, you know, you mentioned the land and so on. So it does make it seem like he came from there. But obviously, you know, he had parents that were Chinese and did um, his father uh, or did his parents or the at least his father come over in search of gold? You know, because because there were Chinese that came for Gold Mountain and all that kind of stuff. And was that maybe an initial thing? Because that was before they started importing so many uh, workers from China mm -hmm. for the railroad. You know, that happened sort of at the end of the book, you know, when the kids are there in San Francisco and uh, the immigrants are arriving, but it just um, seems like uh, the, the focus is that he is a, a son, uh, it, my impression, he was a son of immigrants in a sense, but he was also a son of the land, like you're talking about. And, um, and, and interestingly, he was accepted by the Native American tribes and sort of raised by them and uh, and yet he really came up against it when it was, you know, with uh, the white miners and the white folks uh, yeah. that he encountered. Yeah, I mean, that makes me think about maybe some of what the book might be doing with thinking about citizenship or like belonging in this particular sense. Right. Like because you're right. It's interesting. The, the moment that Zhang engages with. Um, just this one indigenous character and the the really strong close relationship Ba had with him. So what does it mean, obviously to be indigenous is a particular type of claim to the land, right? A, a particular sort of um, relationship there is very different from the white settlers coming. So then there's this question around Ba and around the kids, right? Where they're always being told they don't belong. And it's like, well, I don't like, I grew up here. I was born here. I don't know. Like my dad's from here. Like, yes, my mom came here from somewhere else, but I don't know what you want. Right. And so there's, there's something really interesting about how the book is engaging with citizenship or belonging or like what it means to um, maybe what it means to be U S American. Um, which maybe, I don't know, for me, I sort of start to think like, was this why I went to a Western <laughs> Like, or engaged with. I mean, again, it's an unusual, you know, unconventional Western, but um, it makes me wonder about that. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about, there's two directions that I kind of want to, two different directions I'm kind of think we could go from thinking about the, the land. One is like the landscape, because in Westerns, the landscape is so important, right? And the land, and especially how Ba is with the land, like it's almost its own character. Um, or there's also just thinking about the different characters and the ways that they like, almost like the, the tropes, the archetypes in a conventional Western, you have the cowboy, you have the saloon girls, you have, you know, the heroes and the villains, the bandits and all this. And so, I don't know, do you have a preference for talking about characters versus landscape? Maybe I both. Maybe <laughs> both. Both. Yeah. Because the landscape is almost like a, a character or an entity in the book. Mm -hmm. It's so figured, so big. But the characters were really well done, I thought. I mean, yeah. you know, they're uh, not conventional. So <laughs> in, in most cases. Yeah. Well, and even some of the names are such a play on, you know, classic Westerns, Sweetwater. Yes. Nelly, the horse. I mean, you know, uh, it's the mountain man. One. Yeah. The yeah. mountain man. Yeah. That, I had to laugh at those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, maybe since we're talking about it, let's, let's go to character then. So, I mean, do you like, I feel like we could talk about all of them, but maybe since we were sort of talking about Western tropes, you want to start with Sam? 
<laughs> this is our, uh, you know, cowboy figure. Um, I mean, I, like, I often think of Sam in terms of in a wide variety of ways, um, queering the Western, uh, whether it's Sam's body, the way Sam talks, um, their actions, uh, because like, you know, Sam makes me think of some of those very complex, <laughs> uh, characters from the spaghetti Westerns who like, is, is Sam a good character or a bad character? Like, how do we, so I don't know, what are you making of Sam? What's interesting to you or what's, um, what's unusual? Um, Sam's a wild character. Yeah. And I feel, and, and she, uh, he, she, you know, kind of, um, I mean, at the beginning with Ba, you know, and, and also I think underlying this is the importance of uh, male children, you know, and, and that kind of thing, you know, when they think they're going to be a boy coming, that's such a big deal. And so Sam steps into that role in a sense. And then, but then she kind of finds out being out there the the that it's better to be a man and she can be as rough and tough and all that as she wants mm -hmm. and more powerful than being a woman mm -hmm. in the in the you know in the west in the gold you know country like that but she she kind of goes back and forth in in ways you know that work for her I think work for him, hear him, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> I know. I feel like Sam is one of those characters who really like the rules just don't apply to them. Right. Like, and, and very it, like, what does Lucy say? Like Sam just shines so brightly um, and just gets to kind of play by the rules that they choose to set. Um which is like, I, it's so interesting because what you're talking about with Sam's disruptions, right? That like, Sam, if, if we have a cowboy figure in the novel, it's Sam, right? And, and from the beginning, like they'll use like, like, you know, hey partner and like with the hard D, right? And like, it's totally like this, this canned dialogue from, you know, really, really early Westerns coming out of Sam's, but then also Sam who, who is like, you know, so much happier to go prospect with Ba than to sit in a classroom. Um, and who's so ready for the adventure of being on the frontier um, in ways that Lucy is kind of not. Um, so yeah, there's there's something really interesting about <clears throat> about Sam in that regard, and I think you're right, Julie, to point to the trauma that Sam experiences. Nevertheless, right, like this is a character who plays by their own rules, but they can't um, they can't step outside of what the Western does to, um, you know, whether whether you're thinking specifically along the lines of race or gender or like. They, they can't step outside of all those um, power dynamics and the violence that sort of characterizes the West in Westerns. Um, there's no way even for this character who writes their own rules to, to sidestep that. Um, it sounds a bit like the myth of the American dream is a bit taken apart and and destroyed with the way things happen with this family and the roles that they play and how hard it is it's not this easy street the streets are not paved with gold and how um, I was just reading the um, dedication that's in the book and just looking at how that dedication seems to reflect that American dream but not really. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that makes sense with what people were noticing about like the gold rush narrative and how we get this refusal of it, right? That like, if they can't quite belong, if they can't quite, um, if they're never allowed to claim the US as their home, then they also can't claim that narrative, right? They can't, um, they don't have access to it. Um, 
which is really interesting than the ways that both of them go about trying to access it. Because Sam is like, okay, I'm going to go adventure. I'm going to prospect. I'm going to play Robin Hood and steal from the gold men and throw it in the ocean. And, you know, and, and Lucy's like, okay, I'm going to get as close to whiteness as I can. I'm going to befriend this young woman. I'm going to do my hair the same way. We're going to dress the same. We're just, we're going to, you know, be as close to the same entity as possible, but then, um, she can't, she still can't have access. Right. Um, I almost was drawn to Lucy the most because at least through the entirety of the novel, she's older. She's kind of more in charge, you know, mas o menos. And um, she has a yearning for order, which is everything mm -hmm. that's not, that isn't their life. And then when she kind of gets it through all the other traumas with in Sweetwater with her relationship with the rich guy, the gold man's, uh, um, what's he called? Yeah, the gold man, mm -hmm. uh, daughter, Anna. She she does enjoy it, but it's not a permanent enjoyment and it gets thrown up anyway. So she, she has no place where she's really um, comfortable. Little bits and pieces, mm -hmm. but it's all still a, a muddle in the end. Yeah especially where she ends up. Yeah. Well, and that's, oh, go ahead, Julie. Well, I was thinking of Ma. So she immigrates and she's really a strong character. She can, she's smart. She knows how to kind of organize and, and that kind of thing. But when she comes up against, you know, the racism and I mean, she, she knows how to scrimp and save and do all they, they can do to make things and then and then they're robbed and then they lose everything and it's like i'm out of here you know i'm i'm done with this i'm tired of you know trying to make it because you know the narrative for um you know the 49ers and the white folks coming forward yeah a lot of them lost out and didn't do well but there was no there wasn't that kind of um you know, we're going to, you can't keep that because you're not of our race sort of thing. Like they had to deal with, you know, it was like an, another layer of hardship for them. Yeah. And, you know, and she says, I'm, you know, I'm after all of that, I'm done. And uh, so I, I don't know, I, I thought the different characters were so well done in the in the sense of um, them being different and having different strengths and that kind of thing yeah and how they experienced the um being in that time and being Im immigrants yeah well and and not just immigrants but children of immigrants you know kind of thing you know we're here we've been here and like in the end um uh Lucy in particular, you know, it's like, yeah, I could go back and, and be with Sam and I'd like to, but you know, I, this is all I know. Yeah. And so. No, I mean, I think that's really interesting too, because Ma, she has like, she's so interesting with her body. So like her voice is always talked about as surprising and scratchy. And then you find out that her voice is that way because of this trauma in her past that's tied to racism, right? And tied to her specific experience immigrating to the US. So then she's already sort of marked by trauma. Just every word she says is literally inflected with her trauma. And then she also is pregnant. And I mean, like, <laughs> I feel like some of the descriptions of her body, there are some that talk about, um, her belly when when they're robbed there's a description of um they don't realize she's lying under the blankets for a minute and there's a description of her belly being like the hills and and she has that um i mean she kind of has pika right she's like eating the earth uh and so like i'm thinking about like what does this mean about her trying to belong here she is like bearing a life in this land and so she is the land kind of she's taking the land into her body but still she's like it's a rejection Right. Um, but then she it's when she's silent and she holds the gold in her mouth and everyone thinks, oh, now you're being quiet. OK, we're like, you know, 
now you're behaving in the way that we're expecting you to, but then she has, it's still subversive because then she has the gold in her mouth and that's how she gets away. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. She's just so, she's such an interesting one. Um, and, and really strong, uh, as Aubrey said. And I, I wonder then about Sam being the one to kind of follow. Oh yeah. That's an interesting point, Aubrey. Uh, because he is the connection, right? He's like her first connection. Um, and then when he goes, um, well, although let's, let's see, she leaves first, right. And he lies that she's dead, which is interesting. Um, so the way, the ways they're killed off or they reinvent themselves too, like there's just so much, um, and the right? non-sequential part, you don't know, yeah. you know, who, yeah. what has really happened in any chronological order. You kind of, oh, wait, you know. Now I piece it together. Yeah. 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 The timeline is, is really um, important <laughs> in that way. Right. Cause we're not getting these. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is, I think Lucy is like ultimately this, the most, in some ways she is the, the consummate survivor of the family. Cause she's so pragmatic and able to like, okay, this happened. I can see that this is going to happen. This is not going to go well for us. Like, let me strategize and make sure I get out of it as um, undamaged as possible, but I'm not going to make it out without some sort of damage, right? She's so um, pragmatic in all the decisions she makes, um, which is, she's, I don't know. I mean, I'm curious about Lucy I'm curious what you think of Lucy just in her, her character, how she navigates the world. Cause it's like, in some ways it's her story. She's really our main character, but in some ways she kind of fades into the background of the story. Um, and then she's so preoccupied with stories, with history, with um, who gets to tell the story, with who's erased from the story. Um and, and then all the stuff about stories that that comes up in the end with sort of she kind of becomes a story. I don't know. Um, so I'm, what are your thoughts on her character or maybe, uh, you know, I popped another question in the chat, but um, maybe just on stories in general, because we do have this this really prominent theme of stories and storytelling uh, in a variety of ways. Um, so and I think Lucy's tied to that. Um, as a character but what are your thoughts on her or on stories and storytelling in this novel I think Lucy is a survivor I think she's extremely intelligent but she's mm -hmm. more um she likes learning she likes um you know the the um structure of a classroom you know where of course mm -hmm. Sam is is kind of the opposite he he, she is experiential and wants to get out there and, and, and uh, be in a different way. Um, but I think ultimately for Lucy, she, she's, once she leaves the, the cabin and she uh, meets up with Anne and, and experiences that, she learns in a different way. Yeah. She learns about what society is really like. I mean, they've been in the hills and kind of more isolated and had encounters with the miners. Here she's getting what society is like. And so she's experiencing a different kind of education. Yeah. And uh, as we find out, Sam has been kind of doing the same thing off uh, in his, his, her own way. So I don't know. I'm I, I do feel like Lucy was a central, if you had to pick a central character, she was a central character. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I think, I wonder if there's something here because she so badly wants to, I'm looking at Sharon's comment in the chat. She so badly wants to see herself in the story of this land, right? And I think Julie, one of the things that your comments are getting at is like, <laughs> she no matter no matter what she does she's always relegated to like a, a particular story uh that's tied to her race and her gender 
And she just, no matter how she tries to reinvent herself, she can't escape that. Uh, like in the end, there's this, I, I wonder if I'm reading this the same way you are. There's, um, she's in Elska's establishment and she's, um, there's a paragraph, I have the paperback. So for me, it's on 317, but I don't know exactly where it is. Um, Cause I know the hardback and the paperback of different pages, but um, she says, um, let's see, for two days, Lucy sits reading, searching, her feet tapping as her eyes race across the pages an old wandering itch in her, though she hasn't left the red building. And so she's like this, this hunger for history, right? History after history of other territories across the oceans, um, lands vast and distant, and all of them recorded by men like those she knows. And at this point, there's like not a single decent man that she knows. Um, so there's a commentary there. And then she, then the writing reads, even one history of this territory, a book thick with dust, clumsily written, the name of a school teacher, big across the front. She looks for a promised chapter, but finds in those pages only a few lines, herself reduced to something crude and unrecognizable. And am I right that this is her, this is the school teacher when he promised to write a book or this is what she's like, just a few lines, like an afterthought in the I, text? I didn't catch that until you pointed that out. Yeah. yeah. That's the impression I got. And remember, he really, in a way, he really liked her. In a way, he was using her and, yeah. and wanted to use her mother, too, in a sense. Yeah. And um, but this, I, I saw this as a commentary on history in general, where mm -hmm. and just think about the picture of the um, workers uh, when they drove the last spike for the railroad and they did that picture and all the Chinese yeah. were left out of it. Yeah. This is a, an, another kind of commentary on being kind of relegated to a footnote in history is my opinion. So, yeah. I had the reaction that whether it's a written history, an oral history, a tale of any of these characters, their backstory, everything could be bent and shaped mm -hmm. nothing was solid the story could be molded however you wanted it to be yeah well then you have these characters in elska's house who or her her establishment who are made to literally become stories and i i thought that was so interesting that this transcends you, you know we, we're following lucy and sam we're following their family so we're obviously being asked to think specifically about Asians in America, right? And Asian Americans and what um, what it means to be Asian American in these foundational narratives of the nation. But then you have all these female bodied people who, who transcend racial lines. So there's, you know, the one who's made to become basically the story of like Heidi the milkmaid, right? With her braids and her, you know, and like, and you have um, an indigenous character and a character I think we're being asked to read as um, a Mexican-American woman. And um, and there's a, um, an African-American woman. And, and like when you look at that and see how these these various female bodied characters, like where do they end up? Will they end up like forced into sex work? And they're just, you know made their bodies are literally shaped into the narrative that um that exists for them right like there's no there's no room for them um but then there's then there's something interesting where like you know part of my one of the things I cannot decide how I feel about this book or what I think about this book is like so then what do we do with Sam if Sam the only way for Sam to survive was to leave the narrative, <laughs> like leave the nation, right? Which is also not a uh, positive outcome, right? There's no inclusion. There's no welcoming. There's no belonging. Sam is like literally um, sent across an ocean. So I don't know. Like I think about, you know, how I can't decide how I want to read Sam. And then I also cannot decide what to do with this final half sentence of the novel, Um which, you know, I, if you, if you haven't had the opportunity to read, I don't, I don't think reading the final little half sentence is it's not a, I've probably 
plot spoiled much worse than that for you now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but you know, there's, it's, I don't know, like, is this a commentary on the story being unwritten? Is this a commentary? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious about what the implications are. If it's a story about storytelling, then I guess on sort of like the, the meta textual level, right? Like, what on earth are we to make of the way that this story concludes or really doesn't? <laughs> um, Maybe we could just read that last sentence and, and mm -hmm. just let people know whether you've read it or not. This is how it ends. And, you know, at first it looks like a typo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I'll, I'll read the last paragraph, which is one and a half sentences. Um, she opens her mouth. She wants, and then there's no punctuation. There's, there's no period. There's no dash. It's just, she wants, and that's, that's all. <laughs> that's the end right um i mean you know but it's it's the gold man the she refers to as the gold man asking mm -hmm. her what does she want you know mm -hmm. and and i i mean i've thought about this and thought about this because you know i wanted the ending to the story what does she really want does yes. she want <laughs> does she want some gold so she can get the hell out of there and so on does she want to be recognized for who she is? Does she want to, you know, she's kind of concluding that she doesn't really want to go back to China because she doesn't really know China, but she'd like to be with Sam. I think she's in, you know, feeling indecisive at that point. And so, you know, who, I'm not sure what she would really want. You know, she maybe wants more than one thing. So. A, it's a difficult thing, but it was, yeah. I, years old. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I see, you know, and Sharon asked, does the want show the complexity of the story? And I, what I recently read um, or started reading, I'm not done with it, um, a critical text that's, it's called um, Surface Relations. Um, and it, the subtitle is Queer Forms of Asian American Inscrutability. And the author talks about how one of these one of these tropes that um, is so often applied to um, people who are Asian or have Asian descent in the U.S. is this idea of inscrutability. Oh, they're so hard to read, right? And, and oftentimes in older, more openly racist films, you'll have the word inscrutable actually applied to the character. Um, and it's this idea of like, oh, you know, no one can read this person. So then we can't trust them. And it's like tied to outsiderness, right? And what the author of Surface Relations argues is that um, in some literary and I think cinematic texts, um, Asian Americans are engaging with inscrutability and embracing it in a way that is... Um, that denies, like intentionally denies access. So in, like it's shifting the agency, right? Instead of someone from the outside saying, oh, that person's hard to read. Um, this is a move coming from the inside saying, yeah, I'm not gonna let you in here. You can't read me. Uh, and when I read this, I thought of the end of, of Zhang's book and was thinking, oh, this might be one place where that's kind of a move. Like, are we being denied access to um, to Lucy's desires because she's been through quite enough. And now we just don't, we don't get to have that intimacy anymore because this has been such a violent um, journey in so many ways that now that she is uh, to have her freedom, um, we don't get to come along. We don't get to 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 go there with her because that is all hers. Like I wondered, it made me kind of rethink how I was, thinking about the ending. Um, I still don't know what I think about it, but it was an interesting interesting moment where I, I read um, uh, this author's theories and was like, hmm, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I have a question about um, the symbolism or possible symbolism uh, of like Chinese symbolism. I mean, all the chapters are, you know, the salt, plum, water, you know, et, et cetera. And I, and I would want, have wanted almost a glossary to refer to, to know a little bit more about how the author was using that. 
and um, and some meanings with that. Also, there were these references like jackals and um, tigers and so on. And uh, I, I would assume that that meant coyote in, in our you know, um, uh, reference here, coyotes and mountain lions. But, you know, in, you know, Chinese lore and so on, it would have been more jackals and tigers. But and also there's a crossover. Jackals and some of the miners that robbed them were like jackals. And then there were others that were like tigers or, you know, so there was a, a crossover there. But I would love to have been able to ask the author, how were you, you know, how are you using this? What was your intent with that? Any it were did any of you pick up any of that or and what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Did you all have any thoughts on that? I almost imagined it as some kind of a tapestry or um, a, a, a scroll with these images in it, although I can't explain them, but sort of a pictorial visual painting kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I found it kind of fascinating that we have a tiger but the tiger is actually sam drawing drawing pictures in the dirt <laughs> like i thought there was something clever happening there about what uh what people are expecting or or wanting and how sam was really toying with that right uh kind of striking fear into the residents of sweetwater <laughs> um the jackals is interesting. I, I hadn't thought of that, but how you pointed out, with, especially with the the men who robbed the family. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Can you hear that in my background? Okay, good. There's construction. It seems. Um, so with the with the men who robbed them, I don't. That's interesting. Like thinking about because they're in the chicken coop too. That's their house. It was the chicken coop, and like. It made me wonder about, is there something being played with here with dehumanization or a reversal or something? Um, the animal stuff is really fascinating. And then the tiger with the four with the 200, right, is obviously not Sam then. Um, but we also get the tiger as protection right? Like for me, it's on page 89. It's before one of the chapters called, it's before the first chapter called mud in part two. <laughs> uh, it has the, the character for tiger. And this is where Lucy recounts how, um, I guess the narrative recounts sort of through Lucy, how um, Ma draws her tiger. And this is, um, this is for protection and this is about home and this is about uh, belonging. And so, so then I thought, well, if, if, if we're told the tiger is about home and belonging, um, then I don't know, then you have Sam who becomes a tiger. Is there something about home and belonging there? I'm not sure. Um, Well, tigers are um, generally considered so strong, you know, strong and the, the top predator, the, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, but, and so, and, and there is a connection with Ma and, um, and then with Sam and in different ways with the tiger, you know, Ma's drawing the tiger, that's kind of like her symbol or something. Mm -hmm. And then with Sam, it's more like she embodies some of the characteristics of a tiger. Um, so, I, yeah, I feel like the author is using some of that symbolism or some of that, um, you know, connection with animals uh, yeah. in her descriptions. Yeah. Well, that's interesting to think about because you mentioned the the 
chapter titles, which are so like, I love that you can't be like, oh, it's in the chapter called mud. Cause there's like five chapters called mud, right? <laughs> like, which also your characters are going in circles. So I don't know, but um, the, it's funny. Cause the ones there, like gold, salt, skull, wind, mud, meat, water, blood, like so many of them. Um, I didn't even question. I was like, oh, this is the West, right? This is the Western. This is the, the gold rush. This is that gritty, um, you know, sort of wild, uh aspect of the western genre um except plum right which then i was like oh but plum but then i think those i think that those were the chapters that featured ma a little more prominently uh so then i wondered too about like her she also like she she's a little different than sam she chooses to leave the narrative right sam kind of chooses it but also like kind of has no choice um, but Ma, like, I think, like you all pointed out, she's just like, yeah, I'm sick of this. Like, I'm out. <laughs> um, and so I wonder there with her character, maybe there's something because she is so not a plum. Right? <laughs> like she is she's not a sweet, soft thing. She's she's like so tough. Right. And so like she's a tiger for sure. Like just like survivor, really, really, like you all said, smart and and um uh you know just clever and a survivor and so i don't know maybe there's something there about is that a narrative refusal on her part um plums or hmm. also made me think of the orchards that pioneers would when they did settle or try to settle or try to tame the land would um plant successfully or unsuccessfully in you know dry land and then sometimes they would be abandoned and and the next group would come through and see this poignant leavings you know mm -hmm. uh, and maybe there were a few dried plums that bloomed even in a desolate place yeah well that's interesting because then that makes me think of if there's a possibility of her um like the idea of fruit or bearing fruit or growing roots or or something to that effect, which kind of makes sense with um, her pregnancy. And then just, she is just known as Ma, right? She's like defined by her motherness. Um, then I wonder that kind of goes hand in hand with how we see Ba uh, disintegrating. Sure, <laughs> it's not a great image but also like slowly becoming the land um i don't know yeah the fruit mm -hmm. yeah so rooted i mean yeah because they're both they're both being metaphorically then planted in the ground um which would seem to indicate something for lucy and sam if they're the the fruit there yeah denise i was just seeing i see aubrey has chimed in uh, sharon said is there a meaning oh. for plum in chinese culture and aubrey's indicated endurance well that makes sense excuse me i'm going to shut my window there was also what wasn't when uh, lucy was with Anne and the wealthy family wasn't there like a crate of plums i mean it it kind of also seemed like a symbol of wealth. You know, you when you had enough money, you were able to get plums or sugared plums, things like that. Well, so when they were at the school teachers too, he remember he had those cookies with plum uh -huh. yeah. jelly or pudding, and they were kind of um forbidden in a way. They didn't, you know, they were offered to Ma and Lucy, and they said, No, no, we won't have any. And then they stole some anyway. I mean, that's an interesting juxtaposition then that the the non-Asian characters seem to interpret plums as like this thing to be enjoyed, this treat, which I think goes along with some of the um, rampant sexism in the in the in those characters. Right. Um, the, the gendered violence that many of them enact. Um, there's an interesting juxtaposition then between viewing someone as this um you know like a this like if it's dessert if it's it's this extra it's this um 
this tree, this, you know, something non-essential. It's not, um, it's not part of the regular, like, like it's an add-on, if that makes sense. Right. Um, but then Ma is so strong and no one will see that. And no one will see the ways that she's preparing her family to endure um, and that she's making her own way regardless of what she's supposed to do. I don't know. There's an interesting, like if we go back to thinking about stories, there's a really interesting juxtaposition um, between being viewed as, you know, in this one way that gives one, you know, little to no agency or value and conducting oneself and like understanding oneself in another way, like this, the power of story, right? Um, I'm reading Aubrey's. Hmm. Vitality and vigor of nature, yeah. And courage and strength. Yeah. I mean, that that seems to very much go along with Ma's character both her, um, you know, her fecundity and also her, her strength, right? Um, oh. Well, I wonder if we're, if we're talking about um, all of the characters individually, then I wonder about thinking about them together. Um, so one of the, one of the questions that I had, had offered was about family because it's like, they're all so individual and so distinct from each other, as you pointed out, right. They're each like so different and interesting all on their own, but then they're also a family. Um, and that's one of the major themes throughout this, throughout the book is, is family. Um, what does it mean to be family? Uh, you know, there's a big question mark there around Ma's actions. Um, the, the decision Lucy makes at the end, um, you know, when she really wants to be with Sam and then, you know, has a sort of hard decision to make, like they're all in some way kind of about family. Um, even Lucy's relationship with Anna and how she kind of, she's almost, almost, gets herself sort of like adopted into the family ish, except not really, because there's still an ultimate rejection. Um, but I don't know, what, what do you think about family in, and how it's portrayed in this text or how the, how family as a theme is explored? Well, this was a, a family, um, in really adverse conditions and about how they work together and stay together, especially Sam and Lucy when the parents are gone, but, you know, cope as best they can and, uh, you know, or not, you know, as in the case of Ba, he finally is just like, you know, <laughs> um, I can't deal with this anymore, you know, um, and it is, is checking out in a, in a sense, but, um, uh, I think that there's strength and weakness all at the same time in, in the characters and in the interactions and, and all of that. Um, but there, you know, was it Ma or Ba who said family is everything? Um, you know, I think it was Ba, you know, and he's trying to say on the wind after he's dead. And, you know, it's important that you family's important, you know, watch out for each other, that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Which is so. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lori. Not to be super grim, but it, I feel like it's saying telling the lesson of like family has no power in a structure like this that's so individualistic like the the bonds of family really didn't do the members of the family much good no i mean i wondered about sam and lucy's separation right like they while they were sticking together things were definitely challenging but they seemed to be almost hitting a stride. I mean, there were some lies. That's kind of a problem, right? But, 
but then they separated and when they separated um you know we only hear a little bit about sam's journey but we see a lot of what lucy was doing and it's um it's both dangerous and also i mean she's kind of um willingly subjecting herself to a certain type of erasure thanks for coming sharon um and so i don't know there's there's maybe something there about there is some something of a relief when sam shows back up um but then at the same time you're right like there are limits right there are definite limits that they can't they can't they're they're not able to save each other uh well or is lucy able to save sam i don't know that's that's one of the questions right um my takeaway is yes families everything but it's not and especially under you know it's hard and under adverse conditions i think that was julie's phrase with so many things against them so many i mean eating the you know scraps of the you know mm -hmm. bones in the from the yard i mean yeah. oh i just wanted to go get them a, some food yeah it's it's really tough it puts even more stress and strain on the a family unit so mm -hmm. mixed bag yeah. plus there there you know i'm thinking of when sam shows back up um with lucy and they leave you know the the gold man and ann's house um and but they are so different in their perspectives of mm -hmm. how they should do things you know sam wants adventure lucy really wants to you know settle down and, and live in a more conventional way and i mean they're willing to give and take a little bit but you can see that they have different perspectives on how they should go and they try to work together but it's still it's difficult so yeah no it's true and i wonder you know there's there's something um they do go such different routes and ultimately they're just um not able to <laughs> to make it um bye aubrey they're not able to um to hold together. And I wonder how much of that has to do with this. Oh, it's at um, the public market down on Higuera, slow public market. I think it's, uh, so sorry, Denise had asked where the AAPI festival is. There's, um, it's Saturday, May 13th from 12 to three at the slow public market down on the corner of Higuera and Tank Farm. Um, so it should be, yeah, nice. Um, but yeah, uh, I wonder, you know, we were talking about stories and I wonder about how Sam tries so hard to be the cowboy, right? Like, I mean, right down to the first a carrot, then a rock in the pants and cutting cutting off all of their hair and um, binding their chest, right? And, and really trying to fit into that, but is refused access to that narrative on both um, basis of race and biological sex, right? And so then there's um there's no place for sam like if sam wants to actually be sam <laughs> then then there's no room for sam in this kind of uh environment right and then lucy tries her other way but then ultimately lucy does the really interesting thing of like just signing up to become the story like in a way she does what mod says right like you always know what they want and know who you are, who you are and then give them what you're willing to give them um so she kind of use your beauty as a weapon use your body as a weapon yeah and and she knows exactly how she as an asian american woman is fetishized and objectified right and she's like okay if that's what you want and if this is what's going to help me save Sam, then I'm willing to do this. Um, so there's an interesting, I don't know, I'm just thinking about family and love. And like, there's, I think there's some strong messages about love, but also, this is certainly not a love can overcome <laughs> kind of narrative, right? Like, this is very, this is that kind of Western narrative, where it's really just, it is a stark, brutal landscape. 
and these children who are disadvantaged in this landscape and this kind of narrative based on uh, race and sex are, um, I mean, they're just, you know, thrown to the wild and, and their love is no match for everything. I, oh, oh, sorry. Um, I was just thinking about that. So in the end, when, when um, Lucy is at Elsky's, so you find out Sam's been there before and she worked there. So she had to kind of conform and go back to being a woman for a while in order to make enough money or whatever to, to get back to, I think, to then get back and go get Lucy and take her back again. So also, you're saying Sam became a prostitute at Elsky's. See, that I was sure. I that thought was he was he she was a handyman or did some other chores. Uh, I, I thought I Sam don't... was a client because Sam liked to be bathed. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Sam. So maybe Sam that was it. So I wasn't yeah. sure. It was a little bit vague to me on that. But also remember, Lucy sees the the blue book of Elsky's with. Um, uh, uh, names in it, and she sees Mom Ma's um, tiger symbol in there. And but then the book gets slammed shut. So you're not sure. Did Ma have to work there for her passage, like they did with the you know the kids thought they had enough money? Well, no, you have to get more than that. Oh, I missed that. And then, and mm. then, so they're, they're at Elsky's, you know, um, and trying to figure out what to do. And so, you know, and, but it, 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 I wasn't sure if the symbol, and I don't think Lucy was sure, was that Ma's signature in there for payment or, you know, what it was when she came through. Wow, so, I, totally, I totally missed that. Yeah, I did too. Have to look um, at the book again, but that's. I mean, I think Sam is really. Um, I think the thing that stands out to me with Sam in terms of any sort of sexual encounter is the um, Sam's trying to rough it as as a cowboy in the frontier, and then we learn like in like a one line little aside we learn that at some point the mountain man realizes the truth of Sam's body and um, rapes them. Right. And like, and so then thinking about the ways that like, I, I thought that was really interesting in how I understood Sam's engagement with Elska's um, establishment that Sam, they always say like Sam only goes just to be bathed. Um, and I was thinking about like, does, is that something about, be where you can really be your true self is only in this space with other female bodied people who are familiar with the kinds of violences that, that someone like you might be subjected to in this land. Is this a desire to be mothered is taken care of in this wild, harsh environment? Is this something else, right? Cause it doesn't from the description that El like Ex Elska's explanation, it doesn't seem like Sam's visits are sexual in nature. Um, and so what does it mean as someone who has been subjected to sexual violence um, to go to a place where women are subjected to sexual violence and to, to take refuge, to take a bath? Yeah. Like you can be, you can, like Sam is able to be like naked in the like the ultimate um sort of vulnerability especially for someone who's passing like sam is right um it's like the ultimate state of vulnerability and to be able to go do that in a place that um is characterized by gendered violence in this really particular way um i just thought that was there's something Very ironic yeah 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 but she couldn't do that roughing it out in the hills with the miners and with the cowboys she had to yeah. you know full-on pretend you know be who yeah. she was as a, a male you know and at that time maybe that was a safer space for her yeah well it's one of the only spaces that sam can go and pay for like actual 
privacy, right? Like there's, um, I don't know, there's, there's something like in the way that you phrase that, there's something that makes me think about how Sam is navigating the, the violence of the landscape and then, you know, kind of takes on the, the outward appearance of one of these violent figures, but then in keeping with that to go to a place like Elsky's uh, would seem consistent, but then this is where Sam can truly be just Sam. So there's, there's something so fascinating about what song is doing there um, with kind of playing with how people are reading Sam's body and then how Sam is like, locating this this space um where sam can just be sam right and how then i mean elska's place is so interesting because then that's also where um so is she did you have the sense she was of maybe scandinavian or you know if that name is indicative of anything that was my connotation but i wondered but then i didn't she's such a performer manipulator yeah she's she's a madam <laughs> yeah she's a businesswoman you know yeah. running a, an establishment you know yeah and <laughs> well and and her establishment is very it's interesting because it is um obviously you know this this is a space where the um women are being you know leased out for sex work, but also Elska's place is like one of the only places with rules. There, I, I feel like there's something very um, important in that, that contrast that here in this space that is all about exploitation and violence, this is a place where you are not supposed to, um, you know, for, for the women who work there, they're not supposed to be um, assaulted. They're not supposed to be, uh, hit. They're not, they're supposed to be able, like they can call for help if they need to, right? Like it's a, it's the only space that we've seen in the whole frontier in this book where there's actually some manner of protection. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I think there's something very complex happening there. Yeah. Um, and I'm I not think... sure what I make of it yet. I think the whole book, she's she's really brought in um, issues of gender and race mm -hmm. and, um, you know, violence, um, you know, and mix that in the history. In Elska's um, establishment, and she also, you know, as she described each woman who was like the... Um, know the story behind each person they were different races and and they but they were all like you say objectified in the sense there was this you know um way of looking at them and they were also a commodity in a sense um, what, flavor, what flavor do you want today right exactly and uh there is always a lot to think about this wasn't a story to be read straight through and oh you know you're you're done and move on there's for me there was always so much to think about and yeah. you know uh there and and so new um in in her writing i i think yeah. she's she's going to be one to watch yeah well i just put in the chat because i'm so excited about this that um song has a second novel coming out this september it's called land of milk and honey um and interesting that <laughs> that you're you all are just talking about food because it's it looks different. It, it's not a western. It looks like it might be a sort of near future dystopia, um, and you know environmental crisis. Um, a smog has spread. Food crops are rapidly disappearing. And then it sounds like the protagonist is a chef um, who goes to to live in this this other space and try to get away from. The problem is there, but it's, um, it's, I'm very curious about it. It seems like there's some uh, similar things happening with um, maybe thinking about uh, food and thinking about the land and thinking about what it means to, um, to survive. Like I, it seems like there's some, 
Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm very excited for that to come out because this this one came out in what 2020, and I've just been uh, waiting <laughs> for another one. <laughs> so, um, well, we have two minutes left, and I know I, I know this is a really busy time this semester, so I want to be mindful of people's time. Um, is there anything else you wanted to to mention um, about the text since we're you know? since we have to wrap up soon anything you didn't get to I say it, i think it was a great one to choose to discuss because if i had just read it on my own i would i obviously i missed several things that people came up with just in our you know hour and plus today uh I, it gave me much more uh interpretation and depth to it than reading it on my own so that it was oh, nice. definitely a good choice yeah. if i could ever hear the author speak about you know her, just her writing, but this book and, you know, as well, I would love to hear, you know, her take and her, you know, thought processes and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I think she's really, really good. Yeah. Somebody to watch. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this, I hope you get a chance to read it. I have a, oh. I have a copy I can loan you. It's my own copy. Oh, thanks. Okay. I was just, uh, I was just looking on the um, Slow County website to see if they had it in, but I hadn't gotten to find out if they do. But I was hey, just, I'll just <laughs> loan you when we meet for in. coffee. I'll I want to read it. I'll bring mine. <laughs> Yay! Okay. Thank nice. you. I accept. Nice. Thank you. Oh, well, right. I will. I will say one other thing about it. I, um, I've become fascinated with. <laughs> hair in Asian American literature. And there is so much in this. I'm just like, it's just interesting with the, the cutting of hair and burying hair and hair haunting people. And I, there's like, it's a whole, I know I, and I love your purple, Denise. Oh. <laughs> looking at that. <laughs> I've been looking at that since I logged on. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, that's, that's what I've been thinking about with this one lately is just hair. <laughs> so for whatever that's worth. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, well it's been such a pleasure to have you and again you do such yeah. a great oh, job same. And great choice yeah. and hopefully we'll get you uh have you do it again and i hope you get a class next semester we'll just keep yeah. us keep in touch thanks yeah no I'll, I'll be around one way or the other even if i don't i'll probably still want to lead groups like this it's so fun so well and you come Thank up you. with good good ideas good you know it's always good to read something that i would not choose on my own because you know it gets you into a, a different place, a different space. Yeah. It's not um, necessarily your what you're drawn to, but yet you yeah. come back going, "Wow, this was good." Yeah, mm -hmm. I I lead a senior uh, like book club for seniors at a local retirement community, and they've decided we're reading romance next month, and I'm like, "That's out of my normal comfort zone." <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, <laughs> so that'll Maybe be like fun. Colleen but. Hoover or one of those bestseller people. That well, they um, a lot of them have uh, some memory issues, and so we don't oh. read the same book. Um, every we pick a theme or a genre. And everyone reads and we kind of share back and then just sort of chat. And so, so I'm, I'm curious what they'll come up with for romance. Um, I, one of my friends knows someone who just published a romance novel. So this is my excuse to go ahead and read that, but it's definitely like, I go for um, like horror and, you know, <laughs> zombies. And like, so I'm like, all right, we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. <laughs> not really myself, so. <laughs> Good luck with your grading. I know that's going to be intense for you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it'll be. I think the students are relieved and they've been doing a good job of it. So I'm excited to to see their final projects there. But okay. well, we'll meet again at one of your uh, virtual cafes, right? Yeah, that's right. Where in the world will we be next? <laughs> okay, And I will be sure to send this recording to I had about four or five people who couldn't make it. And I know those that left late, I'll send it to them, too. So oh, but, great. Thank you so much for Thank showing you. Thank you. Great discussion. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.